So welcome everybody. Today we're doing the Nebraska Speaker Series. It's our last, um, I don't know, episode. Would you call it an episode, Amanda? All right, it's our last. So. <laughs> okay, good. It's our last episode before um, the CNC starts this weekend. Um, and today we're gonna talk about scales, tails, and scats. So we're thinking mammals, we're thinking reptiles, amphibians. Um, my name's Allie Mays and I'm the Community Science Education Specialist with Nebraska Game and Parks. And Amanda, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Amanda Philippi, an Outdoor Education Specialist out in uh, Western Nebraska, um, working in several parks out here. Okay, thank you. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about the City Nature Challenge. I'm gonna do a brief overview of what the heck that is. And then I'm gonna jump into um, some different mammals you might see around uh, your city during the City Nature Challenge. And then I'm gonna pass it over to Amanda to talk about amphibians and reptiles. All right, so the City Nature Challenge. The City Nature Challenge is a global event focused on finding and documenting urban nature using the app iNaturalist. Really quick, if you have a moment, if you just want to throw into the chat or unmute yourself, how many people do we have that are familiar with iNaturalist? Do we know what it is? If we're not familiar with iNaturalist, it's you, available either on an app or a web page, and it's essentially this really cool app or web site that lets you upload photos or sound clips of different wildlife observations. Um, so when you upload a photo, for example, you can, you know, use your cell phone, take a photo, upload it to the app, and it has some cool AI technology that'll help you identify the species. Um, and then it also has crowdsourcing. So all the naturalists, all the volunteers who are on um, iNaturalist can help you identify what you see. So we don't all know everything, but we all know a little bit. And so um, you get different people helping you identify things on iNaturalist. All right, so the City Nature Challenge has a few different goals. Um, one of those is to connect people to their local nature, especially in urban and metro areas. So we want to connect people to their local nature, but also to each other to build community, um, both in person and online. And we want to collect urban biodiversity data. Um, and we want this data to be available to decision makers, so to managers and to scientists. So iNaturalist is really cool also in the sense that it's open source data. Um, so anyone from a student to a classroom to um, somebody at Game and Parks can log in and see all of the different observations um, in your area um, or all over the world. It's pretty cool. Another goal is to grow volunteer biodiversity documentation globally. And then also we just want to have fun. So I naturally, or sorry, the City Nature Challenge started as a competition, but with COVID it has moved more towards a collaboration. So um, there is still some competitive spirit between the cities um, as we all work to get as many observations as possible. Uh, but we also work together to see how many species we can find globally. So this is just showing the City Nature Challenge growth through the years. So it started as a friendly competition between uh, Los Angeles and the California Academy of Sciences. So, or sorry, San, San Francisco. So the California Academy of Sciences and the LA Natural History Museum kind of got together and they were like, it would be really fun if we got people involved using this cool app, collect as many observations as possible and see which city can do the most. And so that's what they did. And they found almost 20,000 observations that first year of um, urban nature. And so the program continued to grow and expand. And last year, there were 44 different cities, or sorry, 40, 400 different cities across 44 countries. Um, and the challenge broke a million observations worldwide um, last year. So it, the growth has just been amazing. And it's been 
Nebraska has been involved for a few years. Um, Omaha was the first city in Nebraska involved. And then Lincoln's been involved for the last three years. And now we've introduced some more cities, which I'll talk about in a bit. All right, so with that um, you know, growth, we also see a growth of iNaturalist users in general. So the CNC is really this really powerful event that puts a lot of data into iNaturalist. And it also introduces people to it, to the platform, um, which helps the observations, um, the amount of observations they get per year um, grow as well. So the City Nature Challenge takes part in um, two parts. The first one is the observation period. So that's this weekend. So April 29th through May 2nd is the time to get outside, uh, grab your phone or camera and find evidence. So evidence being that photo or sound of wildlife. So you can look around your homes, in your homes, in local parks, schoolyard cities, um, and just document whatever you can. And then comes the identification part. So um, the observation is like what I consider the really fun part. You get to get outside and look for plants and animals, but the identification part is just as important as a fine, you know, making those observations. So during the identification period, people work together to identify um, observations on iNaturalist. Um, and we have a whole week to do that. So four days for observation and then a week for um, identification. And then May 9th is kind of when all the, re the results are tallied and we make an announcement of how much we found. Whoops. So with that uh, identification period here in Nebraska, we do have three events on Zoom that you can join in. And this is just if one, to help make as many identifications as possible, but two, if you participated in the City Nature Challenge and you want help making um, identifications, you're like, man, I found this cool bird or this cool mushroom, but I just don't know what it is. You can log in and we'll have experts on hand to help you make those identifications. All right, so the, the City Nature Challenge in Nebraska has grown. Um, so we do have five participating areas this year. So we have the Omaha metro area, Norfolk, Madison County, Lincoln, Lancaster County, North Platte, Lincoln County, and then Scotts Bluff County. Um, and so, so in those areas that it says like Norfolk, Madison County, I know that can be a little confusing. It just means like Norfolk is the main participating city. Um, however, any observations within the county count if that makes sense. Uh, Amanda over in Scotts Bluff really just made it easy for us and um, was just like, no, we're just saying the county name. Um, so, you know, she did get there. Uh, well, I, couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't split the love between Scotts Bluff and Gearing equally. I know, so there, that's why know, we just said Scotts Bluff County. Yeah. Right, made it easy for everybody. Um, so if you're in one of the participa uh, participating areas, I don't know what's happening today, but words are hard for me right now. Please, thanks for your patience with my um, finding of words. But we, um, if you are in a participating area, so like you're in Lancaster County, you're anywhere in the county, you have your location on on your phone, you take a picture, upload it. As long as you're within that county limit, um, your observations are gonna automatically count to the area total. So you don't have to worry about joining a project or anything like that. However, what if you're not in a participating area? You're like, man, I'm in Chadron, Nebraska, and I really want to do the City Nature Challenge. Or you're in Columbia, Missouri, and you're like, I want to do this, but I'm not in a participating area. Um, the cool thing is anyone from anywhere can participate in the CNC. You do, however, have to log on to iNaturalist and join the City Nature Challenge 2022 Global Project. So if you're in a participating city, all you have to do is upload your observations. If you're not in a participating city or area, you just have one more step and you just have to join this global project. And that's just so um, the organizers know which observations being added to high naturalists are part of the CNC and which ones are not. All right, and of course this event couldn't happen without all of our um, partners statewide. Um, so there's a lot of people and organizations who are working together to make this event happen. So really quick, 
before we move on, um, does anybody have any questions specific to the City Nature Challenge? If you do, you can feel free to unmute yourself or you can pop something in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna assume we are okay to move on and we'll have time at the end too to ask any questions you might have. All right, so we're gonna talk about a few mammals that you might see during the City Nature Challenge. And one of the things to remember during the City Nature Challenge, like mammals, especially in some of those more secretive animals, you might not see the physical animal, but you might see a sign of the animal. And so we'll, we'll go through a few of those today too. Okay, so the first one, we have two images here um, and we have a track and we have some scat. Who can tell me what this mammal would be? If you found this track, you know, you're walking along the trail and all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's a footprint. Oh, there's some poop. What is this critter? I feel like you all know it. And so you're just trying really hard to give somebody else a chance to answer. If we got some answers coming into the chat. So oh, one was boy. very specific as white-tailed deer. We've got deer, um, deer. So yeah, absolutely. This is a deer. This is um, a white-tailed deer. So our white-tailed deer, we do have two types of deer in Nebraska. So our white-tailed deer is um, found you know, they, they can be pretty rural to urban, but mainly they're associated with some woodlands and some adjacent fields. So our white-tailed deer, um, you might not see like this beautiful buck image during the CNC because it's, you know, this weekend. So their antlers are just starting to grow this time of year. <laughs> um, however, you will see white-tailed deer around and they're, one of the signs of the white-tailed deer, of course, is this, this um, big flag-like tail they have. Um, yeah, and then they have their pellet, their kind of pellet-shaped poop, and their little um, their little hoof prints. And then on some of hoof, on some deer hoof prints, you might also see two indentions towards the back, and those would be um, their dew claws. So some deer prints would have that as well. Our other deer in Nebraska is our mule deer. And you might notice the difference um, looking at this guy over here. He has some giant ears, right? So very, very large ears. Um, also, also I'll just flip to this one. Um, here's some differences between the two species um, besides the flag-like tail um, and the ears. You might also see on their rump, um, the mule deer has this cute little heart, white heart um, right there on their rump. And so the mule deer are more associated with Western Nebraska and that rocky terrain they have out there. So Amanda, you know, her participants in the CNC, I would expect to see maybe some white-tailed deer. Here in Lincoln, if you submitted a white-tailed deer, I really hope you have a picture because that would um, not be as likely. The, the mule deer, you mean? The mule deer out here, we would uh -huh. have mule deer. Yep, yep. Words are or hard white tail. Today. Right, we might, we never you know. Have a short, you have variety elk? out there. You might even right? have an elk. We never know. You know, yeah. smorgasbord. Okay, we have a little footprint here. Who's this? Who's this fun little critter? What do we think? Raccoon. Okay, we have somebody saying raccoon. Any others? Yep, raccoon, raccoon. It is indeed a raccoon. So raccoons have these cute little hand-like footprints. I think of them being like looking like little tiny hands. Um, and our, our raccoons are found year round urban to rural. I have some um, in my neighborhood who, um, if I go out just right after dark, they just crawl out of the storm drain under my neighbor's car. And it's just like a whole little family come out. Um, so they're not picky eaters. They'll eat pretty much anything, um, including our food waste or our trash. So they do really well in urban environments. You might see them during the CNC. If you do want to, to snap a picture of them, it, um, you might want to try right out after, after dark. Okay, you're walking along and then you find this scene. What do we think this is? We have some hair, some bones. 
a little skull there. Okay, somebody said owl pellets. I could see um, owl pellets definitely will have some bones in them and some fur. Um, this one does have a, a larger skull. Awesome, yeah, so this one is an opossum. Um, so opossums are our, our only marsupial here in Nebraska. Um, they're found mostly statewide, but definitely less common in the Northwest and then most common in the Southeast. Um, they also are omnivores, so they'll eat a variety of foods, including plants and vertebrates, um, trash, you know, food waste, um, small mammals, birds, and more. And you can't see super well, but they have this long rat prehensile tail too, and really cute pink noses. So I know a lot of people don't necessarily are super fond of opossums, but I think they're super cute. Okay. We found some tracks. We even have a ruler to scale. And this is really good if you are taking pictures for identification to put something in the photo just to give us a scale of what the size of the footprints are. Um, so it doesn't have to be a ruler. It could be something simple like a key or chapstick, you know, something that's kind of uh, a known size to people. Oops, I just jumped ahead. So this is our striped skunk. Um, so skunks are found, striped skunks are found statewide, um, definitely urban to rural, and they also eat a variety of foods, including insects, small vertebrates, and plants. Um, so we do have a second type of skunk in Nebraska called the spotted skunk. However, it hasn't been seen in the state uh, since 2017. So if you do find a spotted skunk, please, please, please let us know. Okay, we have another track here. Looks like we have a, a paw print. There's some little claw indentions, it looks like here. What do we think this is? We're getting fox, bear, dog, bobcat. They're all really good guesses. All right, so this one is of a red fox. Um, so I did point out these claw marks right here. So on our canines, we're gonna see those claw marks um, most likely in our in our prints. However, if it was something like a bobcat, we would not, we wouldn't see those um, claw marks because they would have their claws most likely retracted. Ooh, um, we have a, a good question in the chat. Sorry to distract, but- oh, please. Um, Somebody wanted to know the difference before, before we got too far ahead between a skunk and an opossum footprint. So before we got too far along, um, the skunk footprint is what about an inch, inch and a half, two inches? Not, not very, very big. Um, opossums have more of like a hand footprint type yeah. of a, a thing. Um, going on. So the size is going to be a little bit different. And then um, the skunk has a little bit more of a, I don't know, I want to say a back pad. Is that, is that a better description? And then the, on the, the skunk, I think of the skunk as having more of like a, yeah, it's more of a paw, what I consider like a paw print with that pad. And then the possum, you know, you see with the possums are, did I not show a possum print? Um, I don't think so. No, we got no. the cool image of one. Maybe yes. I can, I can find So possums that. kind of almost look like they have a weird thumb. My oh, saying. Somebody's already on top of things. Oh, thank wow. you for sharing. Yeah, wow. thank you. Whoops, can you all see this? Is it sharing this part of the screen? Yes, it is. Oh, oh look wow. at that. Look at that. Yeah, so. Oops, sorry. Here on. Um, a, and the, this is a good point too, the front and the back, um, or it's the back and the front are slightly different. So yeah, and it has that kind of weird thumb that I was talking about.
That's a great resource. That is a really good resource. Thanks for sharing. Oops, slideshow. All right, are we back? Yes, now we can see that awesome paw print. Yeah, and I, I want to point out too, you'll see most of these images for the mammals are from, um, they're actually from iNaturalist. So when you sign up, you can say whether or not you want people like to have creative commons on your photos. So if people can use them or not use them. And so iNaturalist can also be a great uh, resource for getting wildlife photos um, if you ever need them or even just for reference. Okay, now we have a we have a paw print and we have a um, sorry, we also have some scat here. Whoops, jumping right ahead. Sometimes I don't give you time to answer. I just click ahead. Um, okay, so coyotes are found um, statewide, urban to rural. Uh, they also are omnivores, so they eat a variety of different um, foods, and their poop will reflect that. Same with the foxes and the raccoons. Anything that's an omnivore, it's going to really show their diet. So for this one, uh, this particular scat ate some sort of little critter, right? It has a lot of fur in there. Um, <laughs> for if it was eating more of like something with seeds or berries, that would be showing up in the scat as well. So it's kind of cool to look at the scat and kind of associate it with the diet. Okay, I'm passing it on to Amanda. Um, so yeah. She's gonna blow our minds with reptiles and amphibians of Nebraska, right, Amanda? That Yeah, exactly what I was just gonna say. I know this is everybody's favorite topic, so I'm just warning you in advance, there will be pictures of snakes. You so mean like snakes super, are not your super cute hognose? I, I know. So I'm just preparing some space. people mentally. Okay. Preparing you mentally for what is to come. So um, we are going to talk about some of the reptiles and amphibians that we might be able um, to see, right? Um, however, um, we might not see the critter just see signs of the animal. So if we go to our next slide, we'll be able to see some of the signs that the animals leave behind. So um, this weekend, um, we are going to um, be seeing um, possibly some, some weather out here in Western Nebraska. Um, and so I'm not sure if we're actually gonna be seeing many of these reptiles or amphibians, but um, we'll be able to hopefully see some of the signs that they leave behind. So I don't know, is there a way I can click or do you have to nope. click for me? I, yep, you have to say next slide, please. Oh, okay. So here's here's some <laughs> pictures. So on one side, um, we have uh, one, of, one of our reptile friends and then the other side, we have an amphibian friend. So if um, we don't see the animal like out here, we might not see, we'll find out, I don't know. Um, so on the left hand side is one of a uh, our slithering snake friend, and I always get this question: um, What does snake poop look like? I feel like everybody needs to know the answer to this question. So um, down on that left hand side, you can see that nice pile of scat there. That is from a snake friend. It reminds me kind of of bird, but um, it's a little uh, looser. I guess is a nice way that I'm going to see it. Okay. Um, Compare that to the one um, picture of scat with the coin next to it, the quarter. We might see some of that. That's from our toad friend, okay? So our frog and toad friends are gonna have more of a cylindrical scat, um, especially if um, they're out feeding at night, maybe by your porch light or something like that. You might find some of these um, throughout the summer out in front of your house. Um, and then you can kind of see the different toad tracks there in the mud. So even if we don't see some of these cool critters that uh, we'll kind of come and look into a little bit here in the presentation, we still might be able to see some of the signs that they, they leave behind. So we're gonna jump on in and I'm gonna quiz you on the next slide um, and see if we can guess what type of cute critters these are. So in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, this might be one that you find in your backyard this weekend. Cause Allie, did you have one of these in your backyard? A sneaky one, didn't you? 
Um, yep, so we've got a lot of friends going through. You're right. Um, if you wouldn't mind clicking Allie, we can sure. figure the names of these. We have a couple different garter snakes in Nebraska. Um, we have both the, the common garter snake, and then we also have a plains garter snake, and they're found statewide. Um, <laughs> one of the ways to tell them apart is to count the scales, um, and you go up and you figure out what scale line their stripe is on, which if you're that close to the snake, more power to you. Um, but uh, we might be able to also look at the coloration of the stripe on the back. Sometimes that helps us. But for the most part, if we can get it down to it's a garter snake, I think we're, we're good. Um, they are found statewide. They come out early in March, kind of any habitat. Um, they usually like it around water. This is one of the few snakes that we have in the state that gives actual live birth, which is pretty cool in my opinion. And this time of year, they're getting... Oh, go ahead, Allie. Oh, I just said it's pretty neat. I was agreeing with you. Right. I know. I just get so excited about snakes. So I, I, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't find the mute button there for a minute, Amanda. But yes, oh. I had, I had <laughs> a number of garter snakes in my yard this weekend. And one of them was um, really pale. It was almost white. And it's stripe. It had like a very faint orange stripe and you could barely see the pattern on it. That's the, it was really cool. Uh, apparently in my neighborhood, we have those, um, somebody told me. So oh, yeah, there's some cool. variation in color. And during this time of year, one thing you might watch out for is sometimes um, they're trying to find boyfriends and girlfriends, right? The female releases a pheromone or perfume and that attracts attracts all the boys, right? And they're going to be in this massive mating ball. So heads up, you know, if you see something like that going in your yard, you know, you might want to give them some privacy, but that's, that's just what's happening, right? She's releasing a pheromone. She's trying to, to attract a mate. Um, so you'll be saying that in the next couple months for sure. Um, and they do give that live birth. So that's pretty cool. And we're going to compare it to our next slide, which isn't a quiz one. So, um, this is gonna be a common water snake, right? Um, so the garter snake is a giant snake bowling ball. That's a good way to think of it. Thanks, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> um, the snake that we've got right now is a common water snake. So it's gonna be statewide, except for some of the counties out in Western Nebraska. Um, and it's gonna be that early April through October. Um, Again, they have to be around, or they're usually around permanent bodies of water, and they're going to eat things like those amphibians, the crawdads, aquatic insects, things found near the water. So um, remember this one and kind of some of the markings that it has, and we'll compare that to a couple of the other species. It looks a lot um, very similar to some of the other critters that we have, um, but this one's a little bit thicker, a little bit more um, kind of grayer in color, at least this particular one. Um, and we'll remember that when we compare it with our, um, a couple of the other ones we'll see. So we're gonna um, go on to the next one um, slide. This is one of my favorites, um, the North American racer, right? Oh, the good question, how common are water snakes? So they're gonna um, be more common on the Eastern side of the state. Um, they're gonna be around um, major you know, permanent bodies of water. Um, they're common, but they're not like over common or super common like some of the other species like our bull snake or other things like that. So really good question. Thanks for asking it, Emily. Um, so the racer, these are cool ones. They love to periscope. That means they'll look up and they look around to kind of see what's going on. They are found statewide. Um, they kind of have that grayish, bluish back and a bright yellow tummy. Some people call them yellow bellied racers. Um, they are North American racers. They're found, again, in grasslands, ag fields, sometimes in buildings and things like that. Um, the young look very different than the adults. So right now, um, during the City Nature Challenge, we're probably going to be finding mainly the adults. Uh, but if you find one that's a little bit more like brown, mottled, speckled colored, the, that's a juvenile from, from maybe a previous year. Um, so kind of keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, they eat insects, reptiles, small birds. They are a pretty cool critter and they are super fast. That's where they get their name, racer. They are a pretty quick um, little critter. So um, How we've fast got a are they, Amanda? Oh, they're so fast. 
I don't know. I've never clocked one before. You haven't clocked feel... one? You haven't timed one before? No, but mm -hmm. they um, they sometimes get a bad rap because they periscope. So they come up and some people think they're chasing you. They're not really chasing you. They just want to figure out where you're at so they can go the other direction. So they are pretty fast. But yeah, I'll have to look that up and figure out if somebody has actually like, you know, clocked a, a racer. If they haven't, we should do it. Stop watch. Right? Racer. <laughs> Start line, finish line. We'll get it done. Right? Good idea. Yep. Um, look at the coloration of this next um, snake. And um, it is adorable. This is our milk snake. Oh, hey, somebody already did it. 3.5 miles and I assume miles an hour. That seems like it's a really fast snake. That kind of creeps me out a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Like that seems fast for a snake. It seems really fast. Um, and thank you for looking that up. I was actually just, um, I was being, <laughs> I was being a little, uh, I was throwing curveballs at Amanda and you're over here just like picking them up. You're catching them. Right. And I appreciate that. Thank you for your help. Yeah. Um, so we've got the milk snake. Um, we don't, this one, there's a little ditty. So, you know, if it's a milk snake versus, you know, the really venomous one. So if red touches black, you're okay, Jack. If red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow because that's a coral snake. So thankfully in Nebraska, we just have our little milk snake friend over here and it is non-venomous. Um, yeah, the saying only works in the U.S. Okay. <laughs> um, but this is one that's going to found in grasslands, rocky areas. It's going to eat a lot of small mammals. This is one of the ones that's also going to eat some reptiles as well. So that's kind of a rarity in our, in our reptile world. And then some birds as well. So our milk snakes are pretty cute. They are found statewide. Um, they're tiny when they first hatch, by the way. So I'm hoping to see one again um, during CNC um, because they are a pretty cute, cute critter. Um, and we're, it looks kind of similar. So thank you. This next one here, this is a ring neck snake. Unfortunately, I don't get very many of these out in Western Nebraska. They're mainly on the Eastern half of the state. Um, they're gonna be in late March to October. Again, they have that bright orange ring neck, right? They also have that bright red tail that they sometimes like to curly cue. They're adorable. They're about the size of a pencil. Um, this a little bit longer. Open woodlands, rocky outcroppings are also going to be found um, in our urban environment. So this is another great one to find um, during CNC. They eat lots of worms, insects, small mammals, or excuse me, small reptiles and amphibians. Usually when they're younger, they're going to go after a lot of spiders and um, things like that. So that's kind of fun um, when you have a cute little ring neck snake that's only, you know, three or four inches long and you think you can find as many um, spiders as you can, it, it doesn't end well. So, you know, just letting you know, spoiler alert. Um, but they are really super cute um, and they're um, non-venomous, okay? Um, now I got a quiz for the next one. So Allie, pop up that picture and let's see if we can get some folks identifying this, this top secret one we've got next. So while people are deciding their answer, um, we do have a question. Um, oh, Travis, yeah. if you are trying to find any of these snakes in urban settings, where do you recommend searching? Ooh, that's a really good question, Travis. Um, I would look for places where maybe they can find some shelter. So I know um, like the ringneck snake said like debris piles, right? Or if you have a rock or something in your yard that you can turn over and, and carefully look or some logs or different things like that. That would be the place where I would kind of sneak and look um, in an urban setting. Is there some debris or something like that that they're hiding under and finding shelter? So, oh, we're getting some good guesses rolling in on this bad boy over here. Um, this is the loudest snake we have in the state, just in case you wanted to know. I don't know the decibels that this snake- Can you at. make the noise? Can you give us an impression, please? Well, <clears throat> it, it's, oh wow is that, is that good? sounds just like is that really loud that sounded mm -hmm. just like it all right Perfect. so um we've got a lot of great guesses in the chat and most of you are right right it is um our bull snake friend 
you're really close with a fox snake. If I would have shown you a picture of the head, that would have been a dead giveaway because the fox snake looks like it has a little fox um, footprint right on top. But our bull snake friend has a little bit more yellowish near the tail. Um, we've got those big brown splotches on there. Um, so it's super close to a fox snake. Only this is going to be, um, like I said, the loudest. It can get up to six to eight feet long. So it's another one of those longer ones as well. Um, but like I said, it's going to be found statewide. So if you wouldn't get, mind giving me a click on there, Allie, we can figure out. It doesn't say various habitats because they're found all over the place, right? They're going to eat anything that fits in their mouth, mainly mammals, birds, birds, eggs, some stuff like that. So um, really similar to our fox snake friend. All right. Um, and our next one is one of my favorites. Okay, this is our plains hognose snake. So it's found in the western two thirds of the state. Um, mainly going to be in that short mixed grass prairie, sandy soils. It's going to use that nose to dig out its favorite food, which are toads. So it likes to have a lot of those sandy soils. So this is the type of snake, um, if it feels threatened or scared, it's going to roll over and play dead. Okay. It's got a kind of a black um, belly. It's going to puke. It's going to poop, and it's going to lay perfectly still until you go away. Okay, um, as compared to the bull snake friend, the bull snake friend is going to mimic or act like that rattlesnake. If it feels threatened or scared, it's going to hiss. It's going to take its tail and shove it in some leaves and grass and shake it around and let you know that it's not happy. So there's a couple different behaviors um, that those snakes have. They look really similar. Um, they both have the brown splotchy um, type pattern on there. Bull snake, like I said, has a little bit more yellow. Um, and of course, I have both of those animals as an education animal. The hognose snake is going to be a lot bumpy, bumpier, rough, rougher um, in texture because it's got strongly keeled scales for going over those sandy soils. So um, I don't know if you want to get that close during CNC, but I'm just like preparing you mentally. If you go down to take a picture of it, this little guy will either play dead or he's going to he's going to hiss and let you know that, you know, you're in his bubble. But so we've got a couple different snakes. And the next one is going to be um, one that we need to watch out for during our CNC. And that's going to be our prairie rattlesnake. We do have a couple different types of rattlesnakes in Nebraska. Um, this one is in the western two thirds of the state. We've got some that are more in the eastern part of the state, mainly like the eastern corner um, with the Massasauga and the timber. Um, but this is one that we're going to have to look out for. Um, it is out this time of year during CNC, but it's going to be found in the mixed and short grass prairies. A lot of prairie dog towns, rocky outcroppings, different things like that. Um, mainly going to eat the mammals that are running around here. Um, this snake is interesting and it sort of gives live birth but it sort of doesn't. It's called um, ovoviviparous. So it has eggs inside. Those eggs hatch and, and she gives birth to live young, as opposed to like our garter snake friend just gave birth to live young and didn't have the eggs inside. So this is one of our venomous creatures. Um, the way that we can tell that is it's got a triangle shaped head. All right. Um, we can also notice on the splotches that there's some white rings kind of around that darker splotch there. Um, it's got the rattle and it'll use it and let you know like, hey, you're in my bubble. Um, and if you want to get like super close, you can see the eyes look more like a cat eye than a round pupil like our bull snake friend. But again, I don't want you that close during CNC to, to actually see like the whites of their eyes. So um, be on the lookout for this one. But now we're going to switch it over and we're going to, okay, we're done with the, 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 oh, there we go. Are there any snakes other than rattlesnakes that are poisonous? So um, we have some rattlesnake friends that are venomous, right? Um, we've got some other ones um, that are not venomous to people, okay? Um, so like our hognose friend is venomous, but only to toads because it's a rear fang snake. Um, and it uses to pop and deflate the toad to make it bite size so they can eat it. And those are slightly venomous, but to people, we pretty much have to shove our finger down their throat. So um, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking it. So we've got a turtle friend up here um, and we're getting some questions coming or some, some comments in, coming in. Um, this is one that I think is adorable, but I also have like a couple here at the nature center with me, but um, we've got a few guesses coming in. 
and it is a what do we think it is we've got lighter we got box turtle let's unveil it for him ally let's 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 show him what it is da, da, da. ornate box turtle so it's going to be found in the western part of the state it's going to be out during april october this is going to be in sandy soils in burrows it does not have web feet it's got those big claws it's going to eat plants insects worms um, and it is a turtle and not a tortoise so it's a dry land turtle because it is an omnivore it's a turtle if it was an herbivore it'd be a tortoise so that's one of the ways that, that we can tell based on on our diet of our friends um, so it's got a big dome shell um, the males have reddish or orange eyes and the girls have brown eyes so that's one way you can tell when they become at least 10 um, what what they are um, and we'll compare it to the next one that we have is another common turtle that we have in the state um, but this is more of an aquatic turtle that we have um, and that's going to be our um, painted turtle so um, it looks really similar to that red-eared slider it just doesn't have that red ear on there it's going to have an orange um, belly yep so a painted turtle um, found statewide um, any body of water they are supposed to be omnivores and eat aquatic plants and insects and fish and tadpoles and everything like that now mine don't eat aquatic plants but they're supposed to so um, so those are a couple of the turtles um, eastern nebraska has a lot more aquatic turtles than um, western nebraska so there's a bunch more out there but these are the probably the two most common turtles we might be seeing during cnc um, another one might be a snapping turtle, but um, don't get too close to that one. But one thing that we are going to be seeing a lot of is our amphibian friends, like our bullfrog. So this is the largest frog we have in the state. Um, it's, it's probably going to get to be singing here shortly. And it has a really deep voice. It's a jugaroom, jugaroom. Just like that. Does that sound like, does that sound like a bullfrog? Oh, that's beautiful. I'm gonna. I, I would like at some point to make a recording of all your impressions of oh, reptiles okay. and amphibians, and we'll I'll, send it I'll out see, to everyone. See what I can do. Um, this is a game species in Nebraska, just in case anybody wanted to know. And some people think of it as also an invasive species because they can lay up to twenty thousand eggs from from one female. Um, they eat anything that fits in their mouth. Um, anything from birds, reptiles. They've, they've even seen like it eating um, baby turtles. Um, so anything that fits in it. Compare that to one of the smaller um, frogs that we have in the state is the next little guy. Um, and you might hear, how big are their mouths? Good question. Um, so my bullfrog's got a mouth that's probably two or three inches um, big. So, um, and they just kind of devour anything. It's kind of creepy watching her eat um, the one that I have here at the Nature Center. but. Um, are they cannibals? They, they can be, that's a really good question. Um, and they, like I said, eat just anything that fits in their mouth and they've been known to even eat Blanding's turtles, um, which are kind of a, a rare species here in the state. So good questions. Um, we've got our chorus frog that's gonna be found statewide. You might be able to hear it singing. Um, and it sounds like you're taking your finger down a comb is the best way. Now I can't do that with my voice, but it sounds like that. It's going to be found in roadside ditches and ag fields. Um, sometimes they come into uh, your yard. Um, so that's going to be um, one uh, cool creature that, that you're going to be able to, to see, hopefully during CNC. Um, and it looks really similar to the next slide, and I always get them confused, the chorus frog and the cricket frog. The cricket frog's got a little bit more of a green triangle and kind of a little bit green on their back. And they're found mainly on the eastern part of the state, um, edges of bodies of water. And they sound like you're hitting two rocks together. Um, so their calls are, are similar, but just slightly, slightly different. And they're about the same size, about mm, maybe two inches um, wide. Um, but I have a next a, a quiz on our next frog. This one's one of my favorites. So this is one that might be not as well known, but I want you to, in the chat, if you know what this species is, go ahead and put it in there. It's adorable. Um, they're pretty cute. They are ones that can go a long time. Um, they actually like can bury themselves 
underground and they make like this mucus lined hole and they wait until there's rain. And then when there's rain, they'll come out. So can you imagine living underground in your own like snot bubble? They're just like a little, a little frog butterfly. They're like, I, yeah. I'm going to go in this little, I mean, you know, a cocoon. I hadn't thought a of a little that. mucus cocoon. And then they come out and they're like, I'm ready world. Yeah. Let's attitude. check him out. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like it should be really bump and roughy, roughy skin, bump and rough skin, but it's really smooth like a frog. Um, so this is our, uh, it's spade foot toad, but it looks like a frog, um, but a plain spade foot, right? Um, they're going to be found uh, in the prairies, loose soil. Um, they have a really cute, like, wah, wah, call. They're adorable. They have the, the cool eyes. I mean, this spade foot is, is, is just one of my favorites. Because I mean, who wouldn't want to live in, in, a, in a mucus bubble underground until it rains? And then when it rains, they'll come out. <laughs> nice. I think it does look like it's in a JC Penny photo shoot as well. That's why I picked this photo is because it looked like it was in glamour shots. You're right. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll compare that to our next friend. Um, it's gonna be really similar. We've got a couple type of leopard frogs in Nebraska. We've got the northern leopard frog, which is the greener looking one. And then we've got the plains leopard frog, which is a browner looking one. Um, one of the ways to kind of tell them apart is the green and the brown, but also they have that racing stripe near their back. And one of them connects and goes all the way back. And then there's one that has two kind of lines that, that kind of parallel each other. Um, so they're gonna be found in wet meadows, you know, stock tanks, different things along those lines. They eat those aquatic vegetations and insects. Um, and this one kind of sounds like a rubber band hitting a balloon is the best way that I can kind of describe it. There are, if you go and, and, and search um, some of these different critters and you just be like leopard frog call, there's going to be a whole bunch of like YouTube videos or things like that that kind of pop up. And then we'll also give you a resource um, at the end that you can go and look it out for Nebraska specific species. So um, we've got a couple of, of the leopard frogs. I've got one more. This is, this is a really common one that we have. This is our Woodhouse's toad found statewide, found everywhere, right? Backyards, golf courses, you know, it's got, um, it's a little different than, than a couple of the other toads that we have in the state, but this is, this is our most common one. It sounds kind of like a, a bleeding sheep. It's a rare, it's a really obnoxious call at like two o'clock in the morning. That's all I'm saying. Um, they have a clutch of, of 10,000 eggs per female. Um, they are a pretty cool little toad and they're gonna be found, like I said, statewide around those sandy soils as well. And then we've got one more quiz. We've got this, this last amphibian here. Oh, we've got a good question in the chat about a frog and toad. Um, so how you tell the difference between a frog and the toad? One way you can tell is like their skin. So the um, toad has really bumpy and rough skin. They need to be near water from the water. Um, as opposed to a frog, a frog has really slimy skin and they need to be near water because they can actually um, breathe through their water, breathe through their skin under the water. And so um, they need that water to stay nice and, and slimy and moist, and um, they can have the potential of drying out. So the skin is gonna be kind of, I don't wanna sell the telltale sign, but is it slimy? It's probably a frog. If it's bumpy and dry, it's probably a toad. So um, yes, so this is the same species, right? This is gonna be our tiger salamander. But the bottom picture is the larval stage. Some people in Nebraska refer to them as a mud puppy. Mud puppy is actually a different species, but it's a, a larval tiger salamander, right? So it looks really common um, as the, I can't say the a, a, analox, anal, I, say, I say it wrong, but um, it's going to look really similar to that, only this is a juvenile salamander. Now, What's really cool is the salamander can choose to be a kid its whole life in the larva stage, 
if it's got a permanent water source. So it could choose to be a kid its whole life. Just like or, Peter Pan. Right? Or if that water source dries up, it, it morphs into an adult. Now, once it becomes an adult, it can't go back to being a kid because it, it goes with, with gills down at the bottom as a larva. And then as it grows up, it, it gets lungs. Um, the typical length of an adult tiger salamander um, is, I don't want to say six inches, seven inches. They can live for over 30 years as an adult. I did not know this until I got one as a pet and I made a very big time commitment. So 30 years, um, the larva can be the same size as an adult. If it is the same size as an adult, that's six, seven inches, chances are it's a cannibal. So it eats other larva tiger salamander. So if you see like a pond and you see these really big ones along with these little small ones, the bigger ones are the cannibals eating its friends. And the smaller ones are probably the one eating their, their you know, aquatic plants and things found in the water. So uh, cool. How do you not like tiger salamanders? We also have other salamanders, but they're more in the eastern part of the state. Um, very east southeast corner of the state. So our tiger salamander friend might be out. Um, usually they're early spring um, and they come out when it's kind of, um, you know, a little bit darker outside nocturnal and then they like the nice cooler temperatures to come out and find a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. So that's most of the uh, reptiles and amphibians that we have. And hopefully you'll be able to find some of these critters during the Nebraska CNC during the observation period, the 29th through the 1st in any of these different areas. Um, so we thank you for joining us here tonight for Scales, Tails, and Scat. What questions do you have? You can either put them in the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to do that as well. And we're glad that you joined us here tonight. Really quick, just to clarify, um, the observation period goes through the 2nd. So it's April 29th through the 2nd for that observation period. Thank you, Allie. I, I just got excited and took a day away. So. I know. Um, I know. So as we ask our questions and um, we get ready to wrap up, I am going to put a um, I'm going to put a little survey in the chat uh, just to tell us how we did today. If um, you have any feedback or anything like that, we really appreciate it. It just helps us make our programs better. So one thing that I also wanted to say is there's a, a great website and I'm gonna put that in the chat as well. So there's the, the thing, the form that we would love for you to fill out. Um, I also have one, UNL has a great resource out there for identifying the different reptiles and amphibians of Nebraska. Um, and it also has some of those frog and toad calls that we were talking about earlier. You can go and check any of those out. Um, and, the, and Dennis does a, an amazing job um, on those different frog and toad calls that are out there. And he'll explain kind of what they sound like and everything like that. So if you find a snake or a reptile, an, an amphibian, they don't quite know what it is, you can check out that UNL website um, and that'll give you a great resource to kind of explore. So I also put in the chat um, just the link to the website for more information about the CNC. I am gonna stop recording. Um,